Welcome to Inspirational Journeys, everyone. My name is Ann Harrison, and before we get started recording today, I had a lovely conversation with my special guest. Her name is Alice McVeigh, and she writes some Jane Austen-esque, I guess you could say, um, books. And so we're gonna we're gonna delve into that. But first of all, welcome, Alice. Hi, I've lost you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there you are. You're back again. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, hello. So, so lovely to see you again. Literally see you. And, uh, and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm well, really excited. Thank you so much. I hope I pronounced your name right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, why don't you tell the viewers and the listeners a little bit about yourself? Oh, and by the way, before you get started, do you have your books to show on the video when we get started talking about those? Um, I can get them. They're very close. <laughs> okay. Well, when we get when we get ready for that, um, I'll let you know. Okay. So why don't you start by introducing yourself to the reader? I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, everyone listening. My name is Alice. Um, I'm kind of stuck in the middle of the ocean. You can probably hear that. I uh, was brought up American in various parts of Asia because my father was a diplomat. And then um, I came back to America and I was almost 13. And I was miserable because I left Myanmar, which I adored. We only had six people in my sixth grade class in Myanmar. That's how good it was. And we had a pony. And um, I came back to America, uh, not far from Washington, D.C., a place called McLean, Virginia. Nothing wrong with McLean. I'm still fond of it. But um, I had to go, uh, go into an American intermediate school. And I was miserable because there are 400 people in my year and I just felt completely lost. Anyway, so what happened was I, I decided I was going to fulfill an ambition of my first 12 years and learn the cello. So I did learn the cello and I absolutely adored the cello. And the cello was just kind of, it, it kind of saved my sanity really because the cello was me and I was able to have an identity as a cellist. And I actually became one of the best cellists in Virginia and and got into Juilliard in the end, though I actually didn't go to Juilliard. I went to Indiana um, instead to study with Starker. And then that led me to Britain because I was passionate about Jacqueline Dupre's playing. Um, and I wrote to her to ask if she'd accept me as a pupil. And I sent a tape because in those days you sent a tape and she accepted me. And I was very, very excited to be accepted to come to London to study with Jacqueline Dupre as a cellist and then I met my husband and I've been in London ever since so now my accent is in the middle of the ocean so I'm part cellist part writer I'm part American part British I'm I have dual nationality and I'm kind of a confused person um but <laughs> that's kind of me in a nutshell really mm -hmm. oh yeah and the cellist thing I saw that on your bio I'm like oh my gosh so do you still play cello I do. I still play cello big time. Well, not as big time as I did. I was very successful when I was younger and played in the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and the BBC Symphony. But now I'm writing full time. Um, my biggest thing on the horizon is a concerto. It's the Elgar concerto. Um, and I'm playing that in November. So I am practicing really hard, but I'm not working very much on the cello because what work on the cello means is hours and hours away, mostly touring. Um, so that's how come I visited 44 countries is mostly I went with various orchestras to different countries, including um, all over Europe and, and North and South America and so. You kind of answered one of my questions. What, what inspired you to, to, to play the cello, but what inspired you to become a writer? Um, in my family, it's almost uh, a given that you're going to be a writer. Uh, my father, I said, was a diplomat. He was a diplomat. That was how he made his money um, until he de uh, joined Defense Intelligence in Washington. Um, but he loved to write. Uh, he was a biographer of lots of American presidents, including James A. Garfield, who wrote that for Norton. So he lived to write. My mother is an editor. She was a very prominent editor in Washington. She's still alive. My father sadly isn't, um, but she's not working anymore now. She's in her 80s. Um, my uncle was a scriptwriter in Hollywood, and I basically grew up writing. Um, the other reason I wrote, to be honest, was I was in I was in places like Singapore and Burma, and now I'm sure you can get all kinds of English TV in Singapore and Burma. But in those days, we had no TV in our own language, so all my sister and I did was read. We read to each other, we read to our parents, we read to we just did nothing but read basically, and so that from that came writing. Really. 
Oh yeah, it, that that's kind of how that happened with me too. <laughs> Honestly, because really? I've been reading. Yeah, because I did um what what they the the over here, the uh, Library of Congress and National Library Service calls talking books, but you might as well call them uh, the um the visually impaired version of audiobooks now because audiobooks are now just a th is, are now a thing. It's not just for the blind and visually impaired anymore. I mean, you can buy audiobooks on Audible and. Uh, Apple Books and different places through, I'd like chirp books and places like that. But yeah, and I would do that, and I could sit and listen to a book or read um, Braille all day long because I they, I used to American Printing House used to have a thing called Century Series where you could buy Braille books for r reasonable prices, and then um, but then they stopped that. So, um, but yeah. And now I'm, I'm I'm a great fan of Audible. My my book Susan is available on Audible, and um, I'm hoping that Harry will be soon. Uh, but it is it is a thing. I think it's partly because people commute so much. I have friends who just they they do most of their reading when they're in their cars, so it's mega. Right. I'll listen to audiobooks or I'll listen to Kindles if I don't have podcasts to listen to uh, during at meal times if I'm not eating with my family, or you know while I'm cleaning or whatever but honestly I like audio but for me and I know this is about you and your books but for me I like to get my hands on the book because it, I engage with it better because audio sometimes my mind wanders <laughs> <laughs> I will be honest. no I get that yes yes I get that I will be honest but um so d I, d d here's a question and I feel this when you play your cello, like when you're practicing or when you just play for the fun of it, do you get inspired? Does it does your cello playing inspire your writing? Um, my cello playing does not inspire my writing, but my cello life has definitely inspired my writing. As a matter of fact, next week, my first novel, the one that was published, Big Five, by um, Hachette, um, will be reissued, and I'm reissuing it myself on my own website, alicemcveigh.com. And this was inspired directly by my playing with the Royal Philharmonic, the BBC Symphony, um, the Ulster Orchestra, the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, all these orchestras. And the more I, I was actually touring with these orchestras and getting to know the people in these orchestras, the more I thought there's a short story in every single, if not a novel, in every single member of those orchestras. And so I decided, I was really young in those days and also stupid. I said, right, I'm gonna write a hundred short stories because there are a hundred people in each orchestra and they're all gonna be amazing and different and fantastic. Well, I wrote seven of them. And then my agent said, you know, it's really hard to sell short stories. Why don't you tie these into a novel and see where we go? So I tied the first seven of the seven people that I'd featured into a novel, and she sold it within a month to Orion Hatchet, which is one of the top five publishers. So that was really good advice, wasn't it? Yeah. Let me know when that comes out because I definitely <laughs> want to read that. Thank you. I'll I love send your work. You. Oh, good. You. Okay, cool. So, um, you got two books. Well, you've got that one that you're getting out, but you've got two. Like I said, Jane Austen esque books. Susan, a Jane Austen prequel, and then uh, you got the Har Harriet. 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 Yeah. 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 yeah that's Harriet. a Jane Austen variation. And in Harriet, what I've done is I've taken Jane Austen's Emma and I've rewritten it from the standpoint of two more minor characters. Uh, one of them is Jane Fairfax, who's the mystery of all of Jane. Jane Austen's book. She is beautiful, gifted, talented, musical, an astonishing, practically professional level pianist and singer. Um, and everyone's fascinated by her and so many authors, even, even in Jane Austen's own time and shortly thereafter, wrote Jane Fairfax's story. Um, Harriet, which I've called it, is much rarer. In fact, I'm the only person, I believe, on earth ever to have written Harriet's story, but it's partly narrated by Harriet and partly narrated by Jane Fairfax. Harriet is wow. um, is is Emma's little little protege. She's pretty but dumb in Emma. And what I've done is I've I've imagined that Harriet appeared to be dumb, but was in fact instead of being stupid, she was pretending to be stupid because she wanted to flatter Emma, 
who really enjoyed flattery and make Emma feel clever. And Emma was clever, but not quite as clever as Emma thought she was. And so basically in my Harriet, Harriet is slightly manipulating the manipulator. So it is a bit different, but I played Jane Fairfax um, straight. Jane Fairfax is as Jane Fairfax was imagined by Jane Austen. And it's an interesting book from that standpoint. The first one, um, Susan, a Jane Austen prequel, that's pure imagination. I did not copy uh, Lady Susan, which was Jane Austen's uh, wicked villainess um, at all. Instead, I imagined what this villainess might have been like when she was not yet exploited, not yet corrupted, and only 16. And I made it all up. So that's a very light, bright summary read, Susan. And as I say, it owes almost nothing to Jane Austen except for the imagining of the character when she was very, very much younger, 20 years younger, almost 20 years younger. So um, that's a bit different. But the other one, Harriet, has been quite controversial because some people don't like the fact I altered Harriet's character. I don't know if you followed the controversy, sorry, controversy, about the latest um, uh, persuasion adaptation, but it's been fierce. I mean, Jane Austen lovers have been tearing themselves to shreds over whether or not Dakota Johnson has ruined uh, persuasion. And part of the reason is Dakota Johnson is being Dakota, Dakota Johnson. She's completely upfront, funny, hilarious, sardonic, out there, lively, and nothing like the Anne Elliott of persuasion. I think actually altering the main heroine is a bit below the belt and shouldn't maybe be done. But a lot of people like it. And a lot of people even love it. And so on every Jane Austen website, there's this huge controversy about it. But I did alter Harriet. Harriet is a minor character, but I did alter her. So maybe I'm wicked as well. <laughs> you know, I have read so many different Jane Austen. I've, I've, I've heard about them, and I read so many different Jane Austen adaptations. There was one book, and I, and I don't remember the name of the novel, but there was one that an author had, adap had adapted from the servant's point of view. Mm. Yeah, and I can't remember. That was Long Longborn by Joe Baker. Longborn, yes. A very, oh a gosh, very famous book. A very famous book and a very good book. I love um, that And one. I think what she did was what was so clever. Uh, Jane Austen, she was never snobbish. And I know for a fact, reading her letters, that she was very good to all those servants. But she never really regarded them as possible characters. And what Joe Baker did so brilliantly was to go underneath the stairs, sort of upstairs, downstairs, on on uh, Pride and Prejudice and present mm -hmm. it from the standpoint of the servants. And that was sheer genius. Yes. So I'm glad you read that. It's fantastic. It, uh, yeah, I loved it. Um, now, the one thing I did not like was, I don't remember who the author was making these weird adaptations, like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. And yeah. <laughs> oh, I tried to read that and I got halfway through it and I just about got sick. <laughs> it's it a was, thing it's, it's, yeah. it's a thing and 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 like dakota johnson's persuasion it may help people younger than we are people in their teens and early 20s to kind of get into austin so to that degree i'm definitely in favor but um no i couldn't get through the zombie one either mm. though i have a lot of friends who like it and it's not necessarily an age thing but it is with me so i didn't i wasn't crazy about it. Yeah, no, I wasn't crazy about that. I, I don't want to read the, the gory <laughs> adaptation. Horror, you know. no. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's talk about your writing process. Um, when you wrote Susan, for example, did how much research went into that? A lot of people ask me that. In fact, I'm always asked this, and I don't know what to answer because I've read two biographies of Jane Austen, and I've read all the letters. But most of my research has been so painless because I just read all the books until I've almost got them memorized. Um, oh. So, in other words, if you read them often enough, I did figure out I'd read Emma um, over 35 times. I read that in twice. Um, that basically, well, that's more than most people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, basically, it is her longest book and her most complex one. But I just loved it so much. I wanted to completely imbibe it. So if you really under, if you really read it that much, then you get to love it so much. And the rhythm of her prose gets into you. I don't want to brag, but um, Publishers Weekly said that I, that my prose and plotting 
were Jane Austen-esque and gave me 10 out of 10. Um, and so basically what I've been able to do, even though I'm half American, is to feel the rhythm of her prose and to attempt to write it better than most people. Anyway, I'll go as far as that without being shot down in flames. And I do feel that if you love it that much, and if you feel it that deeply, then what happens then is that you 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 almost don't need research. Yes, yes, you, there are things you need to look up. There are things you need to look up. Um, and I recommend passionately The Life and Works of Jane Austen by Devaney Lucer of Arizona State University. Um, I've just written a review of that, and I cannot tell you how good it is. The Life and Works of Jane Austen, you wouldn't believe how much she got in one thick book. But the reason why I love that is her style. And it, part of it's done as podcasts as well. So, um, but no, I didn't read that before I started writing Jane Austen. I read it afterwards and um, and it has taught me some things, but what I love most about it is just her style and her, her, um, her attitude. And some of her insights are amazing. And I get a lot of inspiration from some of the things that, that people like Devoni Lucer uh, write. But no, in terms of actual research, I leave that to my husband. He's a professor at the University of London. And at this very moment, what I ought to be doing is I ought to be editing his book, Concert Life in London, 1900 to 1914, which is a very important book and much more important than any of mine. But I'm talking to you instead. So. Well, yeah, <laughs> I know I need to be I need to be editing uh, manuscripts, too. But hey, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Right. This is fun. a part of my, yeah, we're having fun. This is the fun part yeah. of the work we do. Um, <laughs> exactly. So do you, are you a, um, and I don't know if you're familiar with these terms, but are you a plotter, a, pl a pantser, or as I like to call a plantser, do you pl plot a little, pants a little, do you pants all the way? How does that work? <clears throat> I'm a complete pantser, I'm afraid. I've never, I've never done an outline. Oh, wow. Um, and, I, and I've started lots of books and never finished them because what happens is I, I, I get a brilliant idea and I get all excited and I spend four days writing it. And then I realize, hang on, I should have tried to plot this because it's not going to work. Um, and uh, the science fiction novel I wrote was came into that category. It did get a publisher. It got a good publisher. It wasn't a big five publisher. It's called Unbound. And um, But basically, I wrote it as a complete answer, and I just sent it off for funsies, and they accepted it, and I was shocked. And I thought, oh, my God, it's not good enough. And uh, they sent me to a developmental editor who was unbelievably sensational called Sam Boyce, best developmental editor in the world and she basically said this doesn't work this doesn't work this doesn't work and I'm just going well thank you because I wrote it in a complete daze in a complete dream and as a complete pantser and I'm still amazed it got a publisher um so she helped me out big time with that because I got myself in such a mess and I got accepted um so yeah that was just that people say to me why do you write so many different genres but I'm such a pantser I can't stick to one genre so I've written contemporary fiction about orchestra players and you know got great reviews in the Sunday Times and I've written a science fiction book which was just a complete spree and now I'm writing Jane Austen-esque fiction which I adore and I always meant to do but my agent said it wouldn't sell um when I had an agent so I'm I sort of I'm a real pencil I don't know what I'll write next to it I might write something completely different have you ever done <laughs> National Novel Writing Month Yes, I've never tried it. Um, my objection to it is, well, two objections. One was what my agent said to me. She said, I hate December. She said, nine million manuscripts that aren't completely polished wind up on my desk. Um, so I partly hate it for that reason. And I partly hate the idea of being collegiate about it. I'm a very personal writer. I write on my own. And I don't show anybody anything, not even my husband, yeah. until I've finished it. Well, yeah. And so whether it's good or bad or indifferent, and I've written good, bad and indifferent, it, you know, I do it on my own and I don't fancy sort of being there with quadrillion other people going, how many words did you do today? Was it a thousand? Was it a thousand? Oh, go girl. That's not me. Well, yeah, well, you can, I mean, I do it because it it gets me into that routine and if I don't make it, I don't make it. But at least if there's that camaraderie, you know, you're, write, you're writing alone, but yet you're writing with other people, even though I don't do a whole lot with the site. Um, but yeah. It's, it's just well, if it works for you, if it works for you, Anne, that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I just can't imagine it working for me. Well, I think what know. would happen, aside from that, I, get, I have anxiety things. So I'd be going on November 25th, oh my God, I've only got five days to go. It would, it would, it would traumatize me. I couldn't yeah. cope with that kind of pressure. So that's another reason why I couldn't do it. A, I like to paddle around canoe, and B, I, I think the pressure of the, the finish line 
would finish me. Right, um, but now I like the camp NaNoWriMo sessions because you can choose your own goal and work yeah. at your own pace do, during the month, the April and July. That's what I like about those. Um, so, wow. I mean, I absolutely love Susan so far. Um, and you actually have put me... It's like the the London ball was sounded to me felt and I don't want to and and I don't want to put any spoilers, but the London the first London ball that Susan went to sounded more quiet and and it probably wasn't but it sounded more of a quiet. It was. It was dance. a quiet int introduction into society. Right. Right. And then the the one in Kent. Oh, I could hear the crowd and see her dancing all over the place and yeah. Excellent. I'll tell you one one person I kind of took as a as a model for her was Lady Emma Hamilton. Uh, the cover is of Lady Emma Hamilton as painted by Romney, a very un, little known uh, Emma Emma Hamilton as painted by Romney, and of course she was Nelson's mistress, um, an incredibly charming, beautiful. Um, but what I loved about about the particular painting that I picked is she looks very coy and demure, and that's what Susan is when she's sixteen. She's not the wicked, um, manipulative, and and frankly adulterous um, person that that she becomes in Lady Susan. Instead, she's still charming. She's still young. She's still unspoiled by London and by London society. And that was what I was trying to to reproduce. Not the 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 disaster that she became, but what she started out as. And I think that Jane Austen would have liked it because she wrote about the corruption of London. She wrote about London as being a corrupting influence on young girls. And I think that it's not impossible that the Susan that I imagine was that far away from the Susan at 16 that she might have been. Oh, and Lady, Lady, Lady Catherine. Oh, she's a, she's, <laughs> she is, um, <clears throat> she, yeah, she is. <laughs> yeah. She's nice. a lot of fun though. Yeah. And I had a lot of I had a lot of fun writing her because I mean one of the things about Susan is I borrowed characters from Pride and Prejudice, like Mr. Collins and, and Lady Catherine, and I borrowed one from Emma, who is Frank Churchill. And I just enjoy imagining that all of these storylines are happening at the same time. Um, and that again is not that actually is, is not unique at all. Lots of people like to imagine that. But we borrow different characters in different ways, and and uh, I really enjoy doing that. I do. That was that. That was really. It was. That was. A, that's. It's a fun read. It really is. Thanks. So, um, um, do you listen to music when you're writing or not? I'm curious. I think it's really hard for a professional musician to listen to music when they're writing. Um, I think there's part of us that always gets a little bit sort of. Oh, that was amazing. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe, oh, mm -mm, drop the ball on that one because we're too fussy. Um, so I tend to prefer, to be honest, um, something in the way of white noise uh, or, or just nothing. But I sometimes find that Bach, I, I know you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. I am uh, too. Bach, oh my gosh. No, it's absolutely, the Bach is absolutely my composer. And Bach, I don't know if you know this, but at the end of every composition that he ever wrote, he put the following. To the glory of God. Yes. Now, the that. whole thing about Bach is, A, he's the perfect composer. He never dropped the ball. He never was less than just gobsmackingly good. And so I can listen to Bach when I'm playing, when I'm, when I'm writing. And I can listen to Bach. And, and I, that's about the only composer I can, I can write to. Um, and I'm sure it's partly because of that. I'm part, partly because of his beliefs. And partly because he had this instinct i mean even mozart you know he wrote a lot of rubbish minuets and things that people really thought oh god he just wrote that to make money well Bach never wrote anything to make money everything with bach was completely integral to his own his own vision and he had such technique that he never buried himself in a blind alley he was just the ultimate composer so that's that's my one exception. And also my languages are so bad that if, for example, I've got um, a Bach cantata on and that's German, I only understand about three words of it so it doesn't distract me. Whereas if I'm listening to something in English, I get distracted by the word. Yeah, me too. I don't I don't even, I don't do opera, honestly, because I don't understand no. it. I can't, some of the bravado is just too much. Yeah. Me, honestly. <laughs> but, 
and yes, you heard me say that right here on the podcast. But I do love, I do love the the instrument, the the actual orchestral works. Yes, I love those. Those sometimes I'll get lost in the music and get distracted. I mean, it's not that. I mean, a lot of sometimes it helps me focus, but but there are times when I'll start listening and I'll get distracted. Now I can listen to like some chamber music by Daniel Hope. Who is a um, violin? He's a genius. Yes. Yes, he is, and yes. he's he's also a, a music director. But he also is the music the director of the Savannah Music Festival here in the state of Georgia. Yeah. But he's a brilliant violinist, and I can listen to him and and write. I've never tried editing with him, but I can do my writing with him. It's just something about his music is just awesome. Isn't that interesting? Yes. I love I agree, with you, I agree with you about opera. I mean, I'm very fond of opera. And I'm lucky enough, I've got the principal piccolo of the Royal Opera House is my daughter's godfather. So he's, he, I get free or cheap tickets to the Royal Opera House and I always go, I love it. But the idea of writing to it, no way. It's too dramatic, it's too powerful. It just blows mm-hmm. you out of there. And, um, and yes, yeah, so, and also, well, it's just different. I mean, for me, if I'm going to write to anything, it has to be Bach. Yeah, I mean, but but Daniel, I love orchestral music. Now, some of it, some of the classical is just a little too raucous to write to, but I do love orchestral music. And there is a playlist on Amazon Music called Music for Writing. Um, is there? Yes. I never knew that. Yes, if you have a, okay. an Amazon Echo, I can't say her name because she will go off in the bedroom, but... Um, and I've got one in here too. I have to be careful not to say his name. But anyway, okay. um, but yeah, there is a. All right, I will check it out. Yeah, I will we... check out anything in, in on principle. But you know, it is it is funny. People often say to me, "Oh, was your music influenced your writing and so forth?" And to be honest, outside of the fact that um, that learning about human nature through being with orchestras really 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 impacted on my life and impacted on my first fiction the um contemporary fiction um i would say no i would say they're pretty separate and i would also say that they they relieve each other because i can be working really hard writing and then i suddenly think you know i just need a bit of release and i'll just pick up my child and play something and that is just so nice it's suddenly like i'm in a different place and that's so helpful Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because writing is so intense, as you will know, as a writer, yes. it is so oh, yeah. intense. It so is. sometimes you just need to to pull yourself completely out of it. Yep, I like my wind chimes, and I have my own little oh. things that I love to pull myself out of the writing. Sometimes I need to go outside and just brainstorm. Yeah, and let my characters speak to me. Do you, do your characters actually speak to you when you're um? Writing? I think I think they speak to me in, in what they do rather than in what they say. I find that I'm sometimes motivated by characters. They suddenly, no, you're pulling me down a blind alley. But they don't actually say, this is what I would say. They don't actually give me the dialogue. I've never had that happen to me. No. Oh, gosh. That's... I've, had, I've, had them, I've had them object. I've even had an alien object in, in my science fiction. I've even had an alien object to me. No, I would not have done that. <laughs> and that was a very weird thing. Um, but I haven't I haven't ever had, and people do talk about this, and it's interesting that you've had it happen to you. I've never had a character actually say to me, this is what I would have said. No, the, she doesn't say, no, I don't, I wouldn't, she would say I wouldn't do that this way. But sometimes yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I will sit there in my, in my swing that yeah. I have, a hammock swing that I have, or I will be sitting that one time, one time I was, um, um, and this was years ago. I was in um, uh, my bedroom at my mother's house, sitting there in a, in a chair, my feet propped up on the bed, um, just sitting there listening to a magazine, uh, Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. All of a sudden, I heard a snippet of dialogue. I don't remember what it was, and it set me to writing at like ten o'clock at night. Oh. I don't. I rarely do night writing. I'm not going to say I don't because I have. Sometimes it hits me. Um, but. I have actually heard, I've, I've actually dozed off and heard snippets of dialogue. I'm like, wait a minute. Did did, did he just say that? Start talking yeah, about the nice. character. Yeah. It's like, and, sometimes the, and sometimes I'll get inspired. No, nah, it's never happened to me. Oh. Never once happened to me. I think that's rather enviable. What I do get, though, is I, I, don't, I don't write at night either. I'm actually a morning person. I get up at five. Um, but, but sometimes in the middle of the night, about 2.30, about 3, I'll suddenly get a blinding light. Oh, my God. 
that's the twist I need. And so I have to get up and write it down, even though I hate doing that, because I'll forget it by the morning. And um, so I get ideas in the middle of the night, but I, I'm not a night person. When I was at music college, there was a brilliant violin player. Well, there were several. Joshua Bell was the most brilliant. I, I was oh. lucky enough to accompany him in the BBC Symphony. I went up to him. I said, you know, all those other violinists hated you because he was like 12 and they were like 21 to 25. <laughs> and he was just a child prodigy. And he said, I know they did. <laughs> he said, I hope you didn't hate me. I said, no, we were all completely smitten. All the jealous were smitten. We wanted to take him home. But, um, <laughs> but no, there was a, there was a, there was a guy um, who would practice literally. From 12 midnight, this is at Indiana, from 12 midnight until like five in the morning, because that's when he practiced best. And I was just, how can you do that? But um, people are just different. Their time clocks are different. Right. And uh, do you get inspired by dreams? Um, that's an interesting question. I was once in a really bad place when I was in my 30s and I was in for a tough job, and I was desperate to have a baby. And um, all our IBS were failing. We had about six failed IBS. Finally, we had IVF kids, so there was a happy ending. But I used to get a lot of dreams then, or maybe I was only conscious of them because I was actually having Freudian therapy on a couch, you know, and she was always saying, tell me your dreams. So I became very conscious of my dreams in a way I haven't been before or since. And every and up twice during those, <laughs> that year and a half, I got an idea for a short story that came out of a dream. So oh, wow. that was interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think if, if you really make an effort to remember your dreams, there's so much there. But I, I, I'm I much happier now and I don't bother. <laughs> but in that particular time in my life, it was probably the lowest possible time of my life because I hadn't been published at all. And um, I was very, very depressed about the IVF thing. And, uh, and I was having this therapy. So yes, at that point, the dreams were useful. But sometimes, and I don't plan it that way, but sometimes I'll have these weird dreams. And some of the, the ambient, the background scenes don't have anything to do with it. But then it's all, but then it comes to me later on. It's like, oh, so this is supposed to happen. And I see it like, I mean, I've had dreams of climbing and being in the hospital after um, leaving an abusive relationship. And, and sometimes it's because a character was in the hospital. I mean, I see things like that in dreams. Uh, honestly, dreams inspire me. My characters talk to me. Music inspires ah. me. Just different, different things. So that's why I asked that question. So, that's yeah. Oh my gosh, we could talk about writing all day. I love this. Um, what do you have any uh, uh, tips or takeaways that you want the listener or the viewer to walk away with? If they're a writer, I've got one. I've actually got two tips. If they're if they're writers or aspiring writers, okay. one is don't be like me and take a pen name. I think a pen name is a mistake. I did a pen name. Oh, I use my middle names. Um, my real name is Alice Spalding Taylor McVeigh, and I chose Spalding Taylor um, to write my science fiction thriller under. And the reason was there is some sex in it. No violence, but there is sex. Um, and I thought it would offend my normal readers who were contemporary and Jane Austen-esque. So I thought, use a different name. Anyway, that is a complete pain because it happens. A lot of these sites like BookBub will only let you have one name and only advertise under one name. And it's Good just reads a does the same disaster. Thing. Yes. Now, if I'd actually gone AST McVeigh, which I should have done with um, Last Star Standing, that would have been much smarter. So that's tip number one. The second is related. Um, I didn't plan my career at all. I just thought I was going to be a famous cellist. And believe me, that didn't work out. Anyway, um, so basically, I... Um, I stumbled into my genres, depending upon my pants or where I was feeling at the time. And I really would recommend if you're trying to be successful, that you pick a genre and stick to it. So don't be like me. I started off contemporary literary, then I went into speculative thriller, and now I'm writing Jane Austen-esque fiction. And it's much easier. The public has a very short attention span. And in order to really sort of get yourself out there, it's really good to just have one identity, one name, one genre. That's a really good piece of advice. Well, um, I didn't just, take it. Well, <laughs> no, and I'm not taking it either because I'm writing a thriller. And oh, I'm right. through, yes, I'm writing a thriller. Okay. And it was a psychological thriller at first, but then that's yeah. got a lot going on and I'm weighing my character down and she's like no that's not me um yeah and I'm having to rework that one I'm also I've written I've written a book of poetry um wow yeah poetry is hard yeah but it's it is but you know what there's a story behind that and 
um, my listeners and viewers have heard this, but I can share it again. Um, a friend of mine, who is also now my author coach, we meet on weekends, she was, she did a podcast, um, and she, she inspired the 50 word story, and she was talking about her niece, and yes, Jen, I'm giving you a shout out if you watch this, um, she was talking about her niece, um, and they would go to the beach, and there's these long shells. I don't know what they look like, but anyway, they, she called them mermaid fingernails. And she, Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, and she inspired me, and it, I, I tried to do the 50-word story, and that didn't work. But the little story that I tried to write ended up morphing into a poem. And I always said I can't write poetry. It's rare. I rarely write poetry. And the Holy Spirit said, you can't, but I can't. You keep saying you can't, but I'm proving that you can. So since then, I've got a poetry book published. And I've written several more that have only been published on my website. So, yeah, it's not, it's not the easy. It's not like a spur of the moment. I mean, but when I get inspired, I have to write one. And it only takes a few minutes to do it. But, yeah. And then I've got a children's book series that I'm working on, too. A children's chapter book series. So, yeah. I'm a multi-genre author. And I love yes. I love to read fantasy, too. So Well, may, well maybe we both we both have just got too many interests to keep to one thing. But I'm, I'm going to keep I, I, do think, I do think poetry is so hard, though. I've got a friend who's, who's a poet with Faber and really successful. And I said to him, tell me honestly, how much do you make for your poetry? And he said... I couldn't buy all my coffees that I buy every year with my my royalties poetry, <laughs> and I just think it's so hard to do, so difficult to excel in, and mm-hmm. so ill rewarded. It's amazing anybody does it, but my hat is off because I think it's the hardest thing to do. So, it yeah. is the hardest thing to do, but you know what? I'm yeah. not I'm not out to make like millions on no. it. If no. I touch one life, I, like like I say in my challenge, if I touch one life, then yeah. I've done the job, and I and I know I've touched a few. So, um, yeah. So where can people find you online? I am on alicemcveigh.com. Uh, McVeigh is spelled M-C-V-E-I-G-H, just because it's weird. My real name is Alice Taylor, so I write as Spalding Taylor as well. Um, and uh, I, the reason why I'm not Alice Taylor is two reasons. One, there's a famous Irish short story writer called Alice Taylor and has been since long before I started writing. And secondly, a famous cellist once said to me, Alice Taylor, so boring a name. You should be called Alicia de la Talore. And so I still <laughs> always remember that. And I thought if I marry anybody with a good name, I'm swiping it. So I, a long time ago, I married a professor called Simon McVeigh, and I swiped his name. So people always say, oh, you're an Irish writer. I'm going, no, I'm not. I'm British American uh, or American British. But anyway, yeah, so... Um, Susan, a Jane Austen prequel, and Harriet, a Jane Austen variation, are both exclusive to Amazon at the moment. They may not stay that way, but that's where they are. Um, Last Star Standing is Everywhere uh, by Unbound. Um, my new my new old book, my very first book, While the Music Lasts, is at the moment only published on my website. If it does really well, I may shove it out there. But after all, it was Big Five published, so there's probably not that much money in making a paperback of it at this stage. So we'll see and wait. Wait, what happens? Wait, that one out. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you, knowing that you are a Christian and this is a Christian-based podcast, and I'm hoping I'm not putting you on the spot. Oh, no, before no. I do that, before I do that, if you want to show your books real quick. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you want to do frozen. that. It's frozen. The page is frozen, but here Uh-oh. they are, if it works. <laughs> Uh-oh, I don't know. That's okay. It may work, it may not work. If oh, it doesn't if work... It does- that's okay. If it does, that's great. No if it worries. doesn't, we've we've talked about it enough. People may want to go out and look for. It. Okay. <laughs> so, do oh, you have nice. a Bible verse you want to share with us today? Oh gosh, I have so many Bible verses that mean a lot to me. I know, right? <laughs> but which is my favorite favorite verse? Or just um, throw the one out there that 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 you led to throw out there. I don't. It doesn't necessarily have to be your favorite, but. I'm going with Romans 1, 8, if I've got the, the verse correctly, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing high nor low, nothing deep nor... It's it's just the most beautiful verse ever, and I'm going to forget the exact words now. But whenever I feel really low, I think about that, that nothing can separate us, literally nothing. 
Nothing, not war, nor peace, nor famine, nor anything can separate us from the love of God because that is how deep his love is for us. Wow, I love that. I love that. And um, so, and I love Romans eight twenty eight. Um, for we for we know that all things work for good to them that love God and yes. to them who are the called according to His purpose. Yes, and there's more. There's twenty nine and thirty actually go with that too. But I I do recommend you read those three. Um, so, would you like to close us out in prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for this meeting today. Thank you for getting to know Anne. Thank you for Anne's generosity towards me and towards my books. That both Anne's and my works reach out and touch people in a good way. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Alice. This has been wonderful. So we challenge you today to... Oh, before I do my challenge... And I know this is a last minute thing, but I was inspired to do this and we got talking to writing and almost forgot. Do you have a call to action for the listeners or viewers? It could be a challenge. It could be a resource you want to share. It's up to you. Okay. I do have a resource because I'm so passionate about it. If this is working, this is a book that I'm passionate about. And it's not just for people who like to write like Jane Austen or just adore her works. It's for anybody keen on literature and on great literature and on how great literature speaks to us. And it's called The Life and Works of Jane Austen by Devone, D-E-V-O-N-E-Y, Lucer, L-O-O-S-E-R, Arizona State University. It is just an inspiring read. And I would just like to recommend that. Okay. So now for my challenge, which I always leave with the, with the listeners and viewers as I close, we challenge you today to go out there and read to get inspired, write something inspiring, and share your creation with the world. For when you've touched one life, you've touched thousands. Thanks for joining us on Inspirational Journeys. And remember, your story matters. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss an episode. If you're listening on the podcast, don't forget to subscribe and share it with your friends or leave a rating and review because that's how people find the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and have a blessed day.